Good morning, here at the Gare Maritime in Brussels, or out there, following us online, a very warm welcome to all of you. This is Friday, day two of the new European Bauhaus Festival, and a packed day it promises to be. A day packed with discussions, with discoveries, and with ideas. Here at the Gare Maritime in Brussels, a number of panel discussions will be held, focusing on the hardware and software of cities and societies, wondering what works and what doesn't to keep them sustainable, wherein lie new opportunities and approaches. Is it with brain power or new technology that change will be forged? And how do both come to fruition? But you will also be given the opportunity to take a trip to Lagos, Nigeria, in the most imaginative and sensuous way. A trip of 2,200 kilometers in a finger snip. I can uh, recommend that you take part in that. From four o'clock onwards, you're also very welcome to join us on the Mont des Arts, the Kunstberg, in the heart of Brussels, um, to experience all that is soul food and joyous, artistically speaking, musically speaking, and workshop-wise. There, you will also be taken on a tour of Brussels in a very unexpected and imaginative way. On the Mont des Arts, we will also be um, having panel discussions and one of the topics there is the cost and potential of the fashion and design industry in terms of sustainability and creativity. Also recommended, highly recommended. So welcome later today at the Mont des Arts, the Kunstberg. But for now, let's kick off this second day here at Gare Maritime. Talking about cities, considering the fact that cities, or more generally speaking, urban areas, produce at least 40% of man-made greenhouse gas emissions and consume enormous amounts of energy, one might say cities are the problem. But what if they're not? What if cities can be turned into solutions? What if they could be transformed into carbon sinks, for example, or be a source of energy rather than a black hole of energy, if I may say so? Is it conceivable that human activity can be realigned with natural systems so that they are no longer in conflict, but can work together in harmony? Those are some of the questions that the next panel will address. And I now gladly pass on the baton to the moderator of the panel, Ola Murphy. She's uh, assistant professor at the School of Architecture, Planning and Environmental Policy at the University College of Dublin in Ireland. Enjoy. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this first session on day two of the new European Bauhaus Festival. Uh, I'm delighted to be moderating this session, moving towards regenerative design in the built environment. The built environment accounts for at least 40% of anthropogenic greenhouse emissions. So how can we transform the built environment from one based on extraction of limited resources to one that is regenerative? What needs to happen to enable and drive this change? So we're going to be teasing out some of these questions during the session today with our five panelists. Um, the session is in two parts, and we'd also like to hear from you, our audience. Um, and we're going to have two opportunities for you to be included in the conversation uh, with questions and comments from you. So you can ask questions for our panelists using a Slido link here. And we invite you to comment firstly in this first session on the following question. What does successful regenerative design in the built environment look and feel like to you? So after our first round of questions, we're going to be coming to some of those comments and your thoughts on, on those questions. If as well you have questions for our panelists, please feel free to ask them. Um, and then we're going to have a second round of questions in the second part. So I'm now going to introduce our five speakers. We have three here with us today and two joining remotely. Firstly, Geoffrey Erbele. Geoffrey is a British-born architect and co-founder of the architectural company Entropic and the architectural fabrication company Nest. Since 2013, he's worked in Copenhagen, Barcelona and the UK on a range of projects at the urban, building and landscape scale. 
His approach towards architecture has largely been influenced by the fields of urbanism and robotic fabrication in his education in both the UK and the Netherlands, with a prerogative to solving contemporary issues ranging from environmentalism and urban quality to architectural innovation. Jeffrey's focus is on the opportunities unlocked through technology and innovation. He believes that our lived experiences derive largely from our environment, both in how we operate as individuals, but also in what gives our lives value. So within this concept, the role of architects, he says, is to reimagine the world in its closest approximation to our social values, our individual desires, and our relationship with the natural world. This requires a constant re-evaluation of the presuppositions our world is built on and benchmarking against emergent challenges our world faces. Our second panellist, Marty Kutzenen, is Senior Advisor at the Finnish Ministry of the Environment and a Professor of Resource Efficient Construction at Aalto University. He develops national policies for low carbon construction and the circular economy, as well as coordinating related actions between Nordic countries. As a professor, Matty teaches sustainable architecture at Alto's University's Department of Architecture. And in 2021, he initiated the Nordic co-design programme of the new European Bauhaus. In addition, he practices experimental architecture as a hobby and has won awards in both building design and city planning. Martin Rauch is joining us remotely today from Austria. Martin is the founder and managing director of Lame Ton Erde, in Schlins in Austria, and is internationally renowned as a pioneer and expert in rammed earth construction. Over the course of more than 35 years of working with earth, Martin and his company have realized more than 100 projects of all sizes around the world, published three books, and led the industry in rammed earth innovation. He developed a unique prefabrication process that has not only freed rammed earth from its most fundamental drawback, that is, its labour-intensive production, but has also modernised the material to meet the growing demands of the sustain sustainable building market. With his project Erden Pure Walls, prefabricated, unstabilised rammed earth, Martin won the inaugural NEB Prize for techniques, materials and processes for construction and design. His walls contain no cement, making them 100% recyclable and the process ensures that the water used in production remains free from chemicals and allows the finished product to passively regulate indoor humidity and temperature. The sustainability credentials of these walls go even further, making, being um, made almost exclusively of excavated waste materials from other local building projects. Our fourth panellist is Alessio Romaldi. Welcome, Alessio. And he's Secretary General of BIBM, the Federation of the European Precast Concrete Industry and partner of the Concrete Initiative, a project aimed at engaging the full concrete value chain, cement, admixtures, aggregates and concrete manufacturers, with stakeholders on the issue of sustainable construction, and in particular the barriers and solutions to harness its multiple benefits. For many years, Alessio Romaldi has been involved in shaping the framework for achieving sustainable construction in Europe, both at the policy and standardization level. Alessio defines his daily job as the interpreter between two groups of people speaking a different language, policymakers on the one side and the industry on the other. And he works to bridge the gap between long-term vision policies and the short-term reality of the market to achieve shared goals, convinced that only a convergence of these two aspects can really bring the results that society is aiming for. This is particularly true when we speak about society, economy and environment in this complex ecosystem that is construction. That's why the Concrete Initiative became a partner of the new European Bauhaus, to engage in a dialogue with architects, construction companies, real estate developers and the whole of society in order to achieve our common goals, a beautiful and sustainable built environment together. And our final panellist today, also joining us remotely, is Kadri Simpson, uh, Commissioner, European Commissioner for Energy since 2019. Kadri Simpson previously held the position of Minister of Economic Affairs and Infrastructure of the Republic of Estonia from 2016 to 2019. From 2007 to 2016, she was a member of the Estonian Parliament, the Riki Goku, I hope I pronounced that correctly, and was re-elected in 2019. She's a member of the Estonian Centre Party, elected as a Secretary General in 2003 to 2007 and served as its chairperson from 2009 to 2016. 
Simpson has a degree in the history of university in, his, in history at the University of Tartu and holds a master's degree in political science from the University College London. Welcome everybody. It's great to have you here and remotely as well today. I'm going to go now to our first kind of round of questions and beginning maybe uh, Jaffe with you. Regenerative design, it's I suppose in the, the broader context, it's a relatively new concept. Can you explain what's meant by the term regenerative design? Thank you. Um, so I like to think uh, if sustainable design is the idea of not uh, making our, uh, our environment worse, regenerative design is about actively making it better. So the fundamental term, I think, uh, with the term sustainability today, is it is now being transformed into a term merely where we reduce our environmental damage, uh, but not cease it altogether. And it, it's kind of this, uh, this thing where reducing our speed will still get us to the, the bad point eventually. Uh, and so paradoxically, in some ways, the, the term sustainability is almost no longer sustainable. Uh, and the World Wildlife Organization has estimated we've lost nearly 68% of our wildlife since 1970. That's 68% in 50 years. I think we should all be getting pretty terrified at this point. And so, should we be thinking about sustaining this situation? Or should we be thinking about actually fixing it? Should we be thinking about repairing this incredible damage that we've done to our, our, our beautiful planet? And so, I often think, uh, if, if you imagine your favorite place, right, where you grew up as a kid, Maybe you were going through the forest. Uh, maybe there's a stream where you were as a teenager. And try to picture if somebody was to say to destroy that now, they were to build an office or a, a shopping mall in this location. You would feel a sense of rage or, or anger. Yet at the same time, we should be having the opposite uh, motivation almost to create that same bit of nature where it has already been destroyed. We often don't have that same motivation as we do the anger when we lose. And I think this is really critical. So we need to stop thinking about limiting our destructive habits and instead start to think about how we can repair our planet. And so I think this is the core philosophy of regenerative design. Thank you very much. So it's about going beyond the sustainable to something much more ambitious. Precisely. Um, Marty, what needs to happen then at, at all stages of design construction, reuse, and the circular economy to enable this shift that Jeffrey's talking about from the current model of, of extraction to one of regeneration? Well, asking from a policymaker like me, of course, the first self-evident answer would be that we need to have a clear and predictable policy roadmap towards the future, which will then enable an industrial trans transition so that the, the industry can know that what's to be expected and then adjust their, uh, their businesses accordingly. But then I think that's not enough, and this is very self-evident. You hear this at all conferences where that you might attend. And therefore I chose this picture of, of our tiny little blue planet. Maybe you can see it over there on the screen. And I'd like to use this picture as a metaphor. And uh, I think that we should consider that how rare and how unique this tiny little grain of sand where we are dwelling in this vast universe is. And if we think about this planet as our home, and then if you allow me to take a, a little bit a naive metaphor that, think about re fixing your home, renovating your home. So you want to do something nice in your living room. Uh, you want to maybe put new wallpapers and put new floor tiles and stuff like this. So how do you do this? You don't just uh, you know, take off the old stuff and dump that into your bathroom or children's bedroom, no. Uh, maybe you want to see that what's the economic way of uh, reusing some materials within your home. And the same would apply to energy if you would like to, you know, invite friends over to watch an exciting hockey match, for instance, such as we had in Finland recently. So then you wouldn't maybe switch off heating and electricity from kids' room or from somewhere else in your own home just for your own pleasure of having a, for watching a hockey game. Now replace your home with the planet. The planet is our only home for the time being and for the very, very long foreseeable future. So we should be super cautious of how we treat and how we fix our home. And I think this, this goes deeper than just repeating the often heard phrases that, yeah, we need to have policy roadmaps, we need to have this and that sort of like fundamental science and applied science. That's all necessary, of course. 
But then again, it starts from our values, how we look at the world around us. And I think that we should consider this small planet as our shared home. How would you treat your own home? Treat the planet in a similar manner? I think that's a very nice way to connect the two scales of the individual and then the, the, the population of the whole planet. So this value, change of value to one of, of care, I think, uh, which is it maybe what you're saying about um, that perspective of this is the one place that we have to live and we have to look after together and do more than be sustainable. Going specifically then maybe to the uh, materials and construction, I'm going to go to uh, Martin Rauch joining us from Austria. Martin, <coughs> uh, can you explain the materials that you work with in your company, Lehmton Erde, and how they contribute to a regenerative construction system? Material, what we are work is excavation material from the building site. I think this is the most important part for future building because we have so much experience, uh, excavation material. It, it's a million of tons and it is a waste and we don't know what we have to do with this. And, and this is the most important material for our building. Uh, we, it is only... Uh, eroded earth. It is the earth from the side. We, we take it, we, we, we mix it uh, with no cement, no chemical, only with the specific of the different earth. And uh, then we are ramming it only physical. And the earth dries. And if it is dry, then it is very uh, uh, strong and it is uh, yeah, it is a very old technique. It is thousands of years old. And during the industrialization for 200 years, we have um, stopped this, uh, this uh, building system because we take a lot of energy, coal, oil from the ground. We fire the brick, we make concrete, we make steel. and uh, and. We are forgot it to develop this, and I think it is necessary that we uh, re, uh, we, 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 we find a, a new modern solution to build with this uh, excavated material. It's the the earth is everywhere in the world, and uh, it is um, and it is very bright as it is. You can you can use different. Uh, Earths together. So here we are building uh, earth blocks in in an uh, industrial way with a machinery, and uh, it is only built um, as so a set up, and 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 it is nothing else as dried earth. And um, yeah, it's it's for this. Uh, um, it's for the future. Um, it is a very old technique, but in a new way to build. We have to not to change the material. We have to develop the tools to build, to to make uh, to build it easier, and to that we make a lot of research that we have uh, um, uh, also that we. We, we know to build it, that we get more trust to the earth construction. That is the most important part. The technical issue, it is possible, but we have no trust to the earth construction anymore. But one third of the people are living in earth construction worldwide. And I say it is the most important material, earth construction for uh, a sustainable way to building all over the world. And uh, it is necessary uh, that we are use less concrete, but more earth. Concrete is a genial, a general, a very wonderful material, but the problem is that we, we use it too, too much. It is too much. So we have to change, and we have really radical to change to find new solution uh, with uh, earth construction. Thank you, Martin. Um, and the, thank you for the beautiful illustration of the, the use of rammed earth. And I think what the 
What, what I take from that is, is the importance of both innovation in terms of craft and techniques that, we, that already exist, yeah. um, but also the sense of the local and what um, revaluing the materials that are local to us um, can bring to beauty in construction. So you, you raised an interesting point about concrete, and which is a great opportunity for me to go to Alessio. Alessio, <laughs> concrete and steel are two of the materials with the highest embodied carbon. In order to become regenerative, the built environment is going to have to minimise its use of concrete and steel. So how is the concrete industry adapting to the change that needs to happen? Yeah, thank you, Arla, and well, uh, good morning, everyone. Indeed, cement and concrete are responsible for 8% of the total man-made CO2. I can't say that much about steel, but about concrete, the fact is we use a lot of concrete. And why do we use uh, so much concrete? Well, concrete actually is the second most used material uh, in the world after water, and we use as much uh, concrete as all the other construction materials. And why 60% of the world population live in concrete structure? Well, the, the answer may depend on who is, uh, who, is, uh, who is answering, but if you ask to contractor, it's probably because of the value for money. If you ask to architects the possibility to shape their ideas in the way that they want, and users for thermal acoustic properties, for, uh, for the safety, and, and so on. For me, why it is the concrete to use is because it's locally available at affordable prices, which means that it's not only, we are not only talking about short transport distances, we are also talking really uh, involvement in the local communities. And at affordable price, what's the point in having a solution if only the richest 1% of the population can use it? So I think these are clearly the point uh, for so much use of concrete. However, this is not an excuse not to work because we know that there is an issue. We know that there is an issue with, uh, with CO2, with global warming potential. And that's why we are engaged uh, to, uh, to solve it. And as you can, as, uh, as you can see in so some of the slides, in all the roadmaps of the industry, global level, European level, national or even local, it's not only one actor who is involved. It's the whole value chain, starting from the suppliers, cement, concrete, the designers, everyone really needs to, uh, to be involved. And I would say that's the reason why I think that uh, events like the new European Bauhaus have a point, because it's, it's not a problem that one person or one sector can solve. It's a problem that we can all solve together. I think they're really good points that you've made. Um, and the, the, the fact that 60% of us live in buildings that are um, built of concrete means that just the scale of maybe the scale of change we need to make, but also the complexity uh, of the construction ecosystem is, is something that we, uh, you know, it's a complex challenge. It's not something that maybe we can change overnight. And yet there is this urgency uh, to transform if we are to guard this planet that is our only home. So I'm, I'm going to go to the kind of higher level to Commissioner Simpson. Um, maybe to comment a little bit on, on policy, because the built environment, as we said, accounts for at least 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions. And those emissions are, are a combination of the direct use of energies in our buildings, so operational uh, carbon, partly from the production of, energy, of electricity and the heat that we use, but also embodied carbon in the building materials that we've heard about with concrete, rammed earth, timber, etc. So how can the European Commission prompt the scale of change um, to not only decarbonise the, the construction sector by at least 90% by 2040, which is the goal, but also to transform it to be regenerative? That is, how can we transform it to become net energy positive? Commissioner Simpson, I'll go to you. Thank you and good morning. And uh, thank you for offering me such a wonderful opportunity to participate in, in this interesting panel. Uh, because indeed, uh, we do see that there is enormous potential in the building sector, but the European Commission will not achieve uh, the targets uh, that we aim for without uh, strong support of architects and urban planners. But of course, uh, we need also municipalities and cities and uh, construction companies to be on board. So, so um, in this regard, um, I truly appreciate uh, that we have a chance to discuss uh, these topics at this level. And, um, well, I am commissioner responsible for energy. And um, I truly believe that all the 
uh, stakeholders who are planning uh, new newly built buildings they take uh, into account the highest available standards and not only energy efficiency but also uh, well visual uh, the aesthetics but the fact is that most of us we do live in buildings that were built before energy efficiency standards um, gained such a prominence like they do have right now and uh, most of these buildings, they will remain um, well uh, here and they will be used also in 2040, even after 2050. So uh, I, I would like to well, share with you my thoughts on renovation because renovation can change uh, the consumption of energy and, uh, and bring us uh, well, uh, um, significant savings in very short term and uh, the carbon footprint could be on average three times lower compared to a new build if we are starting to to make uh, the existing building stock uh, uh, pragmatically uh, mm, if we start to renovate those so um, you know that the commission proposed renovation wave and recently also EPPD recast to bring the energy performance of renovated buildings to similar level of the best performing new buildings. And uh, we do see that brings uh, multiple benefits. First, the building users will be able to compare the energy performance improvements before and after the works. And, uh, and usually the works uh, cost a fraction of a new build. And third, uh, well, uh, how people in communities have a new opportunity to engage because we can offer uh, via innovation citizens possibility to produce but also consume their own energy and uh, and share and trade the benefits and also um, store carbon locally so it makes it more uh, active uh, and energy transition uh, of course lowers also the consumer bills so uh, i see that there is a huge untapped uh, resource available and uh, we estimate that 80% of Europe's households could potentially produce renewable energy. And, uh, and that, uh, that is also the core of our solar rooftop initiative. But of course, knowledge is power and uh, it all starts with the proper data and competence centers such as one-stop shops. Uh, the European Commission already supports uh, this with the legislation and there are various technical assistance facilities under the multi-annual multi, uh, financial framework to support managing know-how. And, and indeed, coming back to the European Solar Rooftops Initiative uh, that we proposed um, last month as part of the Repower EU. So uh, this also proposes uh, that we should bring back solar panel and solar tile production in Europe. So, um, so these kind of uh, opportunities and initiatives can evolve uh, our aging structures into Europe uh, that uh, that uh, creates us uh, net positive buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Simpson. Um, and I, I think there's a number of interesting points there, <clears throat> which relate to the, the the need for that whole of society approach to this challenge from policy. And it's really great to hear about all of the policy uh, change that's happening at a high level in the European Commission. Um, and, but and that all the way down to uh, the construction uh, ecosystem and, of course, to our, our lives, our everyday lives as people who all live uh, in the built environment. No matter where we are, we share that as common uh, uh, people in the, in the planet. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it, there is an opportunity to see the potential for regenerative design as something that can actually not just be seen as problem solving, but actually as a creative opportunity to make this planet and each of our uh, experiences of living on the planet more beautiful and more fair and more just and more sustainable um, through the principles of regenerative design, which require this whole of system approach. I'm gonna go now to see if we have questions or comments from our audience. Um, we have a few minutes just to hear from you via Slido and you can see uh, on the screen there are some um, kind of uh, overall themes coming up uh, which are in very small text so I might have to look up behind me. <laughs> um, 
So what we, in re response to the question, what does successful regenerative design in the built environment look and feel like to you? Here are some of the comments. And it's really lovely to see the word beautiful right there in the centre as coming up as the most um, frequent comment. And actually there's a workshop this afternoon which is going to be looking at that idea of beauty as one of the three principles of the new European Bauhaus. Because I think it's a, it's a really interesting question and its meaning is changing as we consider this question of um, uh, shift to a decarbonised uh, continent and a decarbonised planet what that means in terms of beauty. And maybe it's to shift from the traditional concept to something um, more nuanced. Uh, green, environmentally friendly, as you'd maybe uh, uh, expect. Natural, which is also interesting because we haven't really touched on the idea of the connection between nature-based solutions and regenerative design, that it is more, more than just building. Uh, there is um, the potential to include the more than human approach, to include biodiversity. Um, and I think you touched on that, Matty, in response to the, the idea about the, um, the, the, the beautiful planet of ours, which is, of course, not just for us, but is for every other um, being on the planet as well. And how do we see beyond that traditional um, human-based perspective? Um, <clears throat> There's some other, uh, hopefully everybody has had a chance to have a look at some of those titles and I think there's um, uh, plenty of ideas in there and a lot to do with reusing the existing as well, which Commissioner Simpson touched on in regard to the renovation wave, which I think is, is really interesting. So demolish less, uh, reuse what we have and do so more carefully. I'm going to just introduce uh, a question for the second slide around. Uh, and the question for this round is what needs to happen to enable and support a transformational shift to regenerative design. What needs to happen and at what scale? So I'd invite you maybe to think about that and to add your comments and, and any questions you have for our panellists onto Slido and we'll come back to them at the end of the second round of questions. Um, so I'm going to return now to our panellists. Um, Jeffrey, can you explain now, going more into your practice in, in Traffic, maybe how some of the projects that you've been involved with demonstrate regenerative design principles? Thank you. I mean, a lot of the focus on buildings today is purely after they've been built, looking at energy efficiency. And what we're really interested in is the embodied energy and how can we sequester carbon. So the project behind me is uh, a startup that we're doing at the moment, which is trying to reinvent what facades can do. And so we're using uh, essentially biological materials, clay, in 3D printed, and finding ways where we can integrate biology. So how can we think about our walls and our cities as being alive? Uh, the next project is a, is a kindergarten, where we've actually built uh, entirely out of wood. And so wood can actually store uh, more carbon than the process of actually making it. And so we're trying to show that wood is not a limiting material, but actually it can be an incredible design tool uh, for people to use. Uh, we're also exploring in this design that there's a playground on top of the building instead of to the side. So we limit the destruction that we're doing to the, to the area adjacent. We're building this watchtower in, uh, in Poland uh, and it's entirely out of timber. Uh, and it's, it's quite impressive what you can do with timber uh, when you utilize it correctly. So again, this is a structure that will store more carbon than release. And uh, it's almost inspired from, uh, from a tree as it expands and competes with other trees in its surrounding area. But instead uh, of attracting uh, sun, actually becomes a space for people to enjoy. Uh, in Russia, previously to, uh, to the whole Ukraine conflict, uh, we were also exploring the use of timber construction. We were speaking to a, a lot of the high-level governments uh, about a shift towards timber construction. Uh, they have a lot of the world's forests, uh, a majority, and so we were exploring if you could construct all of your future housing buildings out of timber, uh, all of the incredible benefits that we could do to the environment. We're also looking at circular economy where you could actually replace facades on buildings with others. This is a project where it was a restoring an industrial harbour, so uh, completely polluted lands, uh, completely destroyed by industry over decades. And instead we imagined we could do essentially floating platforms and underneath we could use nature-based solutions to limit or actually reduce the pollution in the area and bring back life into the water. So this is transforming industry 
into a park space for the citizens. Uh, this is a project that we've recently won in Sweden. It's a, a bridge that crosses a, a river. And uh, although it's clad in steel, actively the, the deck, which is going to be supporting cars and trucks and lorries, is made out of SLT timber. So we are actually using timber as a place where cars can drive over. Uh, this is the incredible possibility with timber. Uh, it is not a limiting uh, material at all. And actually, for this competition, we used timber and we won the competition with this. So as designers, it's often scary to, uh, to propose nature-based solutions because maybe you don't have the government supporting. This was a situation where we won because of this solution. And I think that represents the shift towards uh, embodied carbon designs. So when you, just to touch on that, when you uh, combine embodied carbon and uh, operational energy of a building and the potential for buildings to uh, include renewables, is it possible for the whole of the life of the building actually to contribute back into uh, the, 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 the grid in terms of energy, um, but also to, so to, to, be, to, take, um, to have a, a net regenerative effect? I think it's important to try and get the net regenerative effect before people even enter the building. So it's right at the start of the construction. And there is so much opportunity with, uh, with carbon sequestration uh, construction. And it is so underutilized. And all of the policy action is geared towards after the building is constructed, which is a massive, massive um, uh, loss of opportunity. We shouldn't be building these uh, machines to suck carbon out of the air. We should just be thinking about how we rebuild our cities. There's so much opportunity, and I don't... It, it, it doesn't make sense to me why it's not actually used today. OK, so actually consider, reconsidering buildings as being something that can be, in fact, positive in terms of Absolutely. climate change. OK, that's, that's, it's a huge shift for us to make, I think, even culturally. Um, and, Matty, moving to you then, connecting back to the, the, the new European Bauhaus, which is trying to, um, I suppose, combine all of those scales from policy um, to people on the ground to industry with the consideration of the, the three uh, principles of beauty, sustainability and inclusion. And you talk about maybe how they relate to uh, regenerative design in the building envir built environment. Are they useful to us to help us reimagine uh, this, this world and how it has to change? Well, it's of course very hard to disagree with these three magnific magnificent principles. They are all necessary. I would maybe answer by saying that it's more like how we approach them and better yet, how we implement them in our daily businesses and lives. So that's what ultimately counts, right? And um, if we uh, think about the original Bauhaus and how sort of like radical it was in a way that it dared to question things really in a fundamental manner. The big question was that can we really produce nice furniture in industrial design, in industrial processes? And it was like, no, you can't do that. It's, 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 it's not possible. It's, it, you mustn't do that. But we, we have great examples of design uh, gems from that era and it turned out to be a whole new design style. Uh, this picture is actually uh, from one of the demonstrations that the, the Bauhaus students uh, held uh, over uh, 100 years ago. They demonstrated against the dismissal of the second principal, Meyer, who had very radical uh, social uh, justice agenda and social sustainability agenda. And he was bringing lots of uh, interesting like research-based items into the curriculum of, of, of Bauhaus. Uh, well, if, if their questions were related to social uh, justice and uh, industrialism in solving some of the problems of uh, not having, uh, not people not having enough of like goods, then I think that today we should think that what are, what are the questions that we should dare to ask today that are radical enough? And I think I would say that there are two questions. First of all, the question of biocentrism that you actually touched upon. So I would like to frame it so that what makes us think that we are the, the species on this planet that has right to take almost everything on the cost of other species and even make the other life forms suffer just because we want to have our third summer cottage or trip here and car here. So I think that we should really question this, that 
how to be in balance with nature. As Antonio Guterres said already uh, two years ago, that the defining task of the 21st century is to make peace with nature. That's so profound. And the sec second question is to ask, uh, in, in order to be radical enough, is that how can we uh, collaborate with artificial intelligence that might be much smarter than we are? And if the original Bauhaus dare to collaborate with industry, industrial production of furniture, so I think this would be the logical step that we should dare to have a relationship with artificial intelligence, let AI to be our design partner and maybe even learn from AI. We don't know where this is going to lead us and there are lots of good ex examples in Hollywood movies that it's going to turn into dystopia. But I don't think that, it, that that's the, the whole picture, of course. So, to wrap it up, biocentrism, artificial intelligence, and how we truly embed the Bauhaus values in our daily choices in our businesses and, and lives. If we have time at the end, I might like to return to those two questions because I think they're, um, they're, they're fascinating at maybe um, two kind of radical extremes of the, the, the spectrum from um, ecological awareness of biocentrism to at one side to uh, artificial intelligence at the other. But maybe, um, the, I, so I'd like to hear more in a little bit about um, maybe more of your thinking on those, those two, two issues. Um, Martin, I'm going to go again to you. Um, and maybe there's a connection back to, to Jeffrey's point about uh, embodied carbon. So in your work with rammed earth construction, can you explain how the buildings that you work with sequester carbon? And, and, and developing from that the importance of, of cradle to cradle design. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means, whole, whole of life carbon design or cradle to cradle? Um, and how can that be scaled up from something that's local to something that we can really uh, uh, deliver at scale? Um, yes, I am. Uh, in the first, I will say before the industrialization for 200 years, we have built factory, three story factory with rammed earth. Why? Because it was the cheapest way to build and it was the material on site. And so they use it. And later, then we have get too much energy. And so we forgot it. And um, it is, um, and for um, the, the most important if in, in earth construction is that you can recycle this material 100 times and it is no down recycle. It is always the, the same material. And um, in the mostly if we change the building, if we break down the buildings, it is not because the material is, has a deadline. No, it is, it's changed the, 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 the use of buildings. And so if we, for, for me, for, to, to save the carbon impact is uh, to have the circle of, uh, of uh, excavation, building, uh, the construction, and reuse it to build again, that, that this circle is very small. And then it is very sustainable. And uh, how we can do this? It is uh, what I said before, first, that we have um, uh, a lot of, um, that, no, oh, I can say, um, we use now rammed earth in the same way we have constructed concrete buildings until eight years ago. And if we would only put a small part of development, budget, money into the development of earth construction, we can really change the, the situation. In the moment, um, to build in earth construction, it, it needs yeah, a lot of human work, and the human work is in industrialization uh, country, very expensive. And, um, and there it is, the price is the problem in the moment. And, um, and to scale up for future, it is to 
du, ähm, ähm, ja, du ähm, äh, think about uh, also in, in, in development, in research and also a lot in educa education. Our problem is in the moment that we have not enough uh, skilled workers for uh, earth construction. So because it is not, uh, that is a, a problem. And, and also that we have to design in a, in a, in a, in a earth construction way. We have to, to, to learn it again, to, to build with the limit of earth construction. And um, if we, we find a good solution from, for the architectural design, uh, technical issues and the, um, the, the industrialization, because I say that we bring the machinery to the site and build it uh, in prefabricated elements, so you can really build earth construction also in urban context. In urban context, and it is very important, you can build in earth construction three and four stories high buildings. There is no problem for future. We have to do it. We have to learn it. We have to, to, to find a solution. And I think the, the, um, it needs uh, some help because the earth construction has no lobby. That is the big problem. There is nobody is interested to develop the earth construction from a lobby interest. And, uh, and uh, the other materials to the earth construction in the moment is too cheap or the other or the human work is too expensive. But um, in this, we should uh, work on, on more steps as a research, education, architectural design, and on the tools. These together, bring together, then it will really scale up if there is a, a interest. And for the sustainable uh, future of building, I think it is most important that we build with the earth and on the earth there is growing the plants and um, the uh, and for for me that is uh, uh, that the connection between wood and earth would be really a, uh, also the, the best way for future scale up i'm not against uh, concrete but concrete is very wonderful in in, in infrastructure, in foundation, and but um, it we should, yeah, less concrete and less energy materials and more earth. That is the most important for future. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, you raised a number of really interesting points there. Um, Matty, you wanted to come in yes. on what Martin said. Yeah, just uh, a very quick comment to, to Martin Rausch. Uh, you said that there is uh, nobody lobbying uh, for, for, the, uh, for the rammed earth and, and, and stuff like this. But actually, that's mostly true. But now, actually, in Finland, we have started uh, with government's money. Uh, that is the EU's recovery funds. We have actually started supporting, investigating that how can we do more uh, like clay-based construction and very like low-tech construction in order to find multiple solutions for, for getting the carbon footprint lower. So that's not the only path, but uh, the, maybe the good news to, to Martin is that, yes, we are doing that with EU's recovery funds. I was actually going to say something similar because um, in the, the university that I teach in, we're uh, <clears throat> moving to re completely review our curriculum to how we uh, think about and how we, we teach architecture. And part of that is embracing um, a much wider spectrum of materials. And if you think about even maybe 10 years ago, multi-storey buildings in timber, for example, were, were really quite rare. 
And now, in a, quite a short time, there has been a, a huge amount of innovation in CLT, uh, for example. And it's, as, as you explained, you know, using timber, say, for roads wouldn't have been considered, you know, many years ago when, um, you know, concrete and steel would have been the, the default go-to materials. So I think we are beginning to add a much broader spectrum of materials to our palette and to um, uh, sponsor research in different materials and work in education to try to think about what our, our designers of the future actually need to know. Um, and that can't happen quick enough, I would say. Um, affordability and value were the other point that, that uh, Martin raised. And again, it links in a really interesting way, I think, to, uh, uh, to Alessio. And I was going to ask you um, about value and concrete because at a, at a recent lecture given by Rotor Deconstruction, who are, are an amazing practice based here in Brussels, um, they spoke about reclamation of materials and, the, and material circularity. And they said that the cost of new concrete was three times less expensive than reclaimed concrete because of the cost, the human cost of time to reclaim concrete. Do we need to reconsider how we value materials in order to, um, limit, the, to limit the extraction of what are um, expensive and energy intensive resources? Bless you. May I just first react to the, to the, yes. to the first discussion? No, no, no. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's a fair point that uh, all materials actually should be supported in, this, in achieving the, um, the objective, for example, of the Green Deal. Uh, I think that there is not one solution, but that we should, from policy perspective, but also from um, uh, education, we really need to show the whole uh, possibilities and with scientific-based uh, assessment, really choose on a case-by-case -case the right one. But let's come back to, uh, to the other point, which, I mean, it's, it's a kind of continuation of what Martin, what Martin was saying. Actually, we are now touching I would say the second most important topics that we are dealing with, at least within our, uh, our association, that's circular economy. Because indeed, recycling is, part, uh, is definitely part of it. Well, it's a complex matter, but for me, I, would try, I always try to, to have three key topics in mind. It's less virgin material in, less or no material out, and with the lowest possible energy, as it was uh, also mentioned. So in particular for construction, where you have really long-lived products, this, uh, this idea of circular economy and the part of recycling is just at the end. Doesn't mean that it's not important, but it has to be put in, uh, in perspective of, for example, the design for long-lived structure, the, um, uh, the design for disassembly, for example. Yeah. A lean design which reduces the material as much as possible since, uh, since the beginning. Then you have reduction in operation like maintenance uh, and at the end before even before recycling you have the possibility to reuse reuse the full structure or reuse some of it of its uh, of its elements so this is really uh, key and at the end when you don't have any value anymore in the in, in the structure in the building in the infrastructure then indeed we enter in, in the recycling coming to the point of cost I, uh, I don't know this, uh, this specific work by, by, by Rotor, but I remember some years ago we have been working with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development on, on, on this issue. And actually we see really different situation in the different countries and within a country also be, between different areas. Uh, the distances has a very uh, um, big impact on, uh, on, on the cost, uh, the quality of the material, the techniques that, that are used, the, um, uh, the taxes for landfilling. Mm. I can't give a, a, really a, a, an answer, but generally speaking, when we are in densely populated areas, it is more economically and environmentally friendly than in rural areas, as a, as a general, general speaking. When we now come to, to value, at the end of life, well, I'm, I'm, again, I'm talking about concrete, when you demolish a, a structure, what, what you get actually is not concrete, uh, recycled concrete, is recycled aggregate, the rocks. And that is, these are the, 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 it is these rocks that replace the use of virgin materials for new application that can be, for example, in new concrete or in more generally speaking, geotechnical works, you know, unbound application like road or, or railways. And actually when you look at the value 
this recycled rocks for about the application, it's, it has a better performances, so better value than the natural material because of mainly of the remaining binding, binding power of, of, of these rocks. So to, 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 to make it things very simple, if you have a building and a road to build, use the recycled material for, uh, for the road. If you only have a building because no road anymore or less, less infrastructure, then it is possible. And we have been studying it in different research projects. We can use 75, maybe even more percent of recycled uh, aggregates within new concrete. But does it make sense all the time? No, it depends on what. Well, technically, it's possible, but economically and environmentally, it depends on the local situation. You mentioned design for disassembly. Yeah. Um, and again, it's, it's a, probably a, a, it's a relatively new concept, I think particularly maybe with concrete elements. So do you think we need further research um, centred, focused on design for disassembly? Well, definitely, because disassembly at the end of life is key. W whether you reuse the element or if you want to, to recycle, it is key, for example, to really separate the different mm. uh, flux, uh, flows of materials. So this is definitely a point. So yes, and to answer your question, yes, I think that we need more, uh, more research and more education, actually, on, uh, out of it. <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, again, it strikes me uh, through our, um, where I teach in, in Dublin, University College Dublin, we have students now focusing on design for disassembly, particularly with concrete elements, that's um, how uh, prefabricated concrete elements can be uh, used, taken apart, and then reused, rather than being completely bespoke and tied into structures. So anyway, I passed a building site on my way here this morning, and there was a huge JCB just ripping a concrete structure out, preparing a site for, for a new building. And it struck me that, you know, that's just now, it's part of, well, hopefully, it's now gone into landfill, but it might be. Um, but we need to completely change our perspective around waste circular economy, but also using our design thinking and innovation to be more uh, intelligent about when we use concrete, we use it in a way that is um, where it needs to be used and also that it can be reused and maybe in a future uh, alternative assembly format. Um, I'm going to go back to Commissioner Simpson. Um, Commissioner, We've heard a lot about um, the complexity of the challenges of um, a transformation to regenerative design. Um, and sometimes I think to, to, uh, well, to many people, the transformation in the construction industry can seem to be too slow. And regulations can sometimes maybe seem to, to hinder that progress and that transformation. Is there any way that the Commission can help us to accelerate the scale of change that needs to happen in an agile way? Yes, of course, there are ways, uh, but we have to keep in mind uh, that, uh, that uh, circumstances differ in different member states. And um, from our side, when uh, we proposed two years ago, on top of a uh, multi-annual financial framework, the recovery funds, then we prioritize the uh, renovation because uh, it gives uh, several gains. Well, of course, uh, if you renovate your home, your living conditions will be better and uh, heating bills lower. But uh, two years ago, we also prioritized that, um, that it creates jobs, both uh, for construction workers, but also material uh, production. And, and now we know that uh, this labor intensive uh, sector is actually uh, in need for more skillful workers, uh, uh, but it doesn't uh, mean that uh, the urgency uh, to um, scale up the renovation activity is not there, on the contrary. Um, well, now, at current context, uh, this becomes even more apparent uh, because um, because uh, Europe is um, is uh, very vulnerable. We are importing fossil fuels. Um, well, natural gas, especially, is uh, responsible for uh, for heating in uh, lots of member states. And and now we have made commitment that we, we will 
uh, remove our dependence on fossil fuels from Russia as soon as possible. So uh, this is race against uh, the clock. That means that the innovation needs uh, to, to, to deliver there. And it also means that um, there is renewed support behind fast-tracking building renovation in Europe um, because um, the built environment was the part of the new energy security equation. So, so um, we have to promote it in close uh, cooperation with our uh, national governments. So we have to explain our leaders but uh, this is not so difficult. Uh, most of uh, member states have presented their recovery plans and uh, they prioritize um, renovation there. And then, of course, um, we do have in place also a wonderful uh, network of mayors. Um, uh, well, uh, they are also very supportive. And, and uh, well, of course, New European Bauhaus is there to inspire. Um, but we absolutely need to start moving now to make use of the best technologies, such as bio-based building components and passive design concepts, um, well, or interconnected smart building management systems in our homes. Um, but not only homes, uh, also public buildings and hospitals and schools. So in our proposals, we do see that um, public sector should uh, lead by example. Mm. And, and as you know, there is already uh, uh, legislation um, in place, but now uh, under the current circumstances, the Commission has proposed that we should increase our EU-wide targets. And, uh, and for example, EU-wide renewable energy target, we are proposing that for 2030, um, our energy mix uh, should be uh, should be decarbonized, and 45% should come from renewables compared to 32, that is existing target, and new buildings um, should lead the way with an indicative 49% target for the uptake of renewables. And this is, of course, just an example, but it sends clear signal that uh, that Commission is pushing for this transformation. And and I hope that, uh, that it urges local and national legislators to, to back this effort. And, um, and of course, um, we have to ensure legal certainty that uh, that will bring benefits, but under current high energy prices, uh, um, the payback time for renovation is uh, significantly shorter than it was only two years ago. So uh, funds are available, uh, technical uh, assistance uh, is there. Um, now we have to solve the uh, workforce uh, Topic, and we also announced that uh, there will be a skills initiative um, that the European Commission will support. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and I, I suppose just just to um, remark that I, I, from my perspective, I have noticed um, a much greater prevalence of. Um, connection to European directives, European legislation infused by the, uh, the EU Green Deal and what needs to happen, the renovation wave, Fit for 55, the energy and performance in buildings directive, um, and that, how that is trickling down to local legislation in, uh, for example, I, I see it in, in my country, in Ireland, um, and it's, it's played, the, the new European Bauhaus is mentioned several times in our brand new um, Irish architecture policy. So I see there is this, the momentum seems to be building and that there's this connection between the need for policy and the need for regulations and on the other hand for them to be nimble and agile enough to keep up with the change that has to happen as quickly as it has to happen. So I, I think there are very positive signals there. Um, and I, I was asked to remind everybody here today about the um, a survey that's being run by the new European Bauhaus lab team and they'd like to invite everybody to participate in and it's called the Regulatory Analysis for the Built Environment Survey and the purpose of it is to hear from people who um, in their everyday practice have connection uh, impact with uh, regulations uh, or with policy connected with the um, 
the transformation of the construction ecosystem and our, as designers or as building professionals or as, as people who interact with the uh, built environment. So how do those regulations or policy act as barriers or enablers of transformation of the built environment? And that survey is open until the 30th of June uh, this year and you can find a link to it on the, the NEB website. Um, I'm going to go back now um, to our Slido uh, to hear from our audience. And we had the second question, which was, what needs to happen to enable and support a transformational shift to regenerative design? And again, looking at the kind of word cloud that's come in, supporting policies uh, and awareness are uh, the, the two most um, popular uh, comments. And I suppose there, that links to what we, we were just saying, which is that we, this, the policies need to support change. And uh, I, you know, the first day that, that I had heard about the new European Bauhaus, when the, uh, President von der Leyen spoke about it, she said that she wanted design to enable uh, transformation and delivery of the EU Green Deal, not by disaster or diktat, but by design. And I think that's still really um, important and it still stays in my mind. And that policy should be supporting and enabling and not restricting, not restricting innovation, not restricting research. Matty, you wanted to just comment yes, on that? Yes, uh, about the supporting policies. Uh, this is, of course, highly important. And um, those of us who have, who have been looking at the drafts of the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, as well as the draft of the Construction Products Regulation. So there are actually, in my opinion, very promising things already embedded that are actually moving towards regenerativeness. Namely, there is the... Um, and in the draft text, there is the requirement that one should start reporting carbon storages or greenhouse gas emission removals in a building. So, as we know, we have in the timber, we have the inherited biogenic carbon from the atmosphere, but we can also have concrete solutions that can be even cured with CO2, thus making very like, practically eternal storages of carbon. And the same is, uh, is also in the construction products regulation. So now these both are being discussed and debated. And it's m my personal and very sincere wish that the ambition level won't go down. But we, we can really have these places there in the regulation that can help our businesses to, to develop their you know, products and, and services so that we can, we can really start storing carbon, the fugitive, fugitive carbon from the atmosphere to the long-living building assets. Of course, this is just one step towards regenerative design, but I think it's a very welcome step. And therefore, I think that um, these are critical things that how we can ensure that there is an ambition level that doesn't get faded away as these go through the several processes of, of policy making. One thing we haven't maybe touched on, and it might go back to, to some of those uh, previous comments about maybe ecological awareness and artificial intelligence, is um, the role of humans, people, in, uh, in this uh, uh, theme of regenerative design. And um, I suppose that, is that something that any of you would like to, to speak about, that because we've spoken about it kind of from a very design or policy-centric view so far? Um, what is the role of um, inclusion, people, society and culture in that transformational shift? Maybe I could answer that. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think uh, when there's an oil spill in the sea, people are outraged. There's protests on the streets. But when you build a uh, carbon-intensive building, nobody seems to flutter an eyelid. And I think we need a cultural shift where people are, are actively angry. They're actively furious that this is happening in their city. You know, you, you want your city to be a representation of who you are as a society and as a culture. So if it's not sustainable, then that is a front to who you are as a people. And so I'm hoping that there's going to be this um, maybe consciousness shift where people are actually actively participating in this discussion. And I think that's, that's missing right now in our industry. Yeah, I think so. And uh, maybe even beyond activism, that there's a, a role for participatory uh, design in buildings and in, in 
cities and towns and places. And um, I know that, that part of what the new European Bios is trying to deliver is that sense of inclusion and trying to reach maybe the voices that are less frequently heard from. Uh, and that remains one of the really big challenges um, because if you take uh, social housing, for example, it's such a, a huge proportion of our built environment. Um, and uh, having a say in how you live and what your home is like, going back to your first point, Matty, is um, probably a crucial part of that conversation. So how can that be um, a conversation about shifting to being um, passive participants in our built environment to being active participants? Yes, actually, I think that the, the shifting of values, that's, that's of course a self, thing that we self-evidently need to have. These small incremental improvements apparently seem to be insufficient in fixing the very, very severe state of the planet. So uh, I, I read a book uh, by a Club of Rome the, a couple of years ago in which they were uh, very much underlining that we need to have uh, something called a new enlightenment, uh, referring back to the, to the enlightenment in the uh, 17th and 18th se uh, century, in which there was a shift from myths and beliefs to, uh, you know, scientific facts and what can you really find out about the nature and man and all the beings around you and that we would need to have a similar like way difference in our thinking that uh, we don't take for granted the things that we've been we've been doing so far and 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 you really try to do things better and in in this quest of ours which ha would have to be an urgent one uh, arts culture design and architecture can have a very significant role because it can they, they can somehow make it more understandable and even desirable to live within the planetary boundaries and as it also may be necessary for us to let go of some of the old bad habits and that might may feel difficult to me or my company or or my you know region or to a, a certain politicians voters so Art can also be used for dealing with these sort of difficult emotions and feelings and also feelings that are related to environmental damage, uh, feelings of uh, environmental anxiety. So that's why I feel that in, in the new European Bauhaus it's so excellent that we have the missing component of culture embedded now in the toolbox of, of sustainable construction that hasn't been there so much before. This is an essential improvement, in my opinion, and it hopefully makes it easier for us to adjust our lives and our businesses uh, within the planetary boundaries. So, in a sense, if the original Bauhaus was a paradigm shift um, to reconsider uh, design, uh, and the industrialization or the, 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 the concept of design in the context of modernism and um, kind of, uh, rolling out mass design for, for everybody th through industrialization. This is a different paradigm shift that's going on now and that the new European bias is trying to um, evoke and one that is maybe more, uh, possibly more complex to do because it's, it's slightly messy maybe it's slightly uh it's it's huge it's very broad it goes from all the way up from policy um down to well european policy to national policy um and reaching out beyond europe as well all the way down to design and industry and everyday people living their lives so that's an an it's incredibly ambitious and to create a paradigm shift at that scale um so but yes, I think it's, it's a hopeful paradigm shift. Uh, and it's so nice to be part of that conversation. Um, if there were any other, we, we hit on the um, comments in relation to the question, but just to see if anybody put any questions in Slido, we have a few minutes that we could take questions. I'm not sure if the, the team have, okay. Um, how do you see trans, where waste management? Okay, we touched on waste earlier. And maybe, Alessio, I'm going to go to you for this question. I'm not sure if you can see it. So it's the first one. How do you see transparent waste management in making cities more sustainable? Yeah. Well, indeed, we, uh, we should really change the, our perspective, actually, from waste to secondary materials, secondary raw materials. I think that this is the most important uh, point to be, uh, to be considered here. Uh, there's a... a um, when a structure comes at its, at its end of life and cannot be reused, reused as such, I think it is really important that we see this as a, as a new start 
for, uh, for, for, for new use, for, as I said, in, in the principle of circular economy, to keep everything in, a, in the loop. So I think it's, it's this shift of perception from waste to secondary material. Yeah. Um, and I, I think regulation is going to have to come in there because when it's too easy to put something straight into the waste chain, um, then that, that will be the, the first action. So it needs to be more difficult to waste something than to reuse it. And this was um, a point that was made actually by, by Rotor at their, their lecture as well, which is really interesting because I think it reshifts value. Um, mm. And it connects with affordability, which we were speaking about, because, um, and the, the lobby for Ram Dirt that Martin spoke about, because how do you, how do you uh, increase that, that cultural shift, I think, towards revaluing the intelligent reuse of the resources that we need, which ones we need, when we need them, and really decrease uh, consumerism of buildings as such. And that leads to, I think there was a second question there about, what about a serious decrease in new construction? No matter how stain sustainable new construction is, it contributes to soil artificialization and loss of bi biodiversity. Should we just ban new buildings? Well, I think we should be honest that when we talk about construction and the, the great change that we need to do, there is no way that we can build our way out of the crisis. It just doesn't go that way. We can't say that with building with this or that new fantastic material, all the problems will be gone. No. So decreasing with the consumption, degrowth in, in a controlled manner, unfortunately, it's not a pleasant news. But then again, if you think about the equation, one small planet, growing population, rising sea levels, rising pollution levels, it's a no-brainer that we can't just continue increasing consumption. And that also applies to construction. So that I try to illustrate that uh, to my students by having, showing a triangle that on, on, in, in which the, it is like a priority of resource efficient construction. On the, on the top level, the most preferred option would to be build nothing, use existing spaces. Then, next preferred option, renovate existing spaces to, to fit to your needs. Then, third option, refurbish. And as a last resort, if all else fails, then consider building a new one. Mm -hmm. from super, super sustainable materials. But I think this should be the mindset. And this makes us to need to adjust also our needs, like sp sp needs of space into the frames that we have around us. Because it, it really makes no sense to, you know, destroy the future mm -hmm. of our children by just wanting to have a bit more comfortable third summer cottage. Yeah. We, we put it to our students um, now, we call it building, unbuilding. So the, the, if, if they want to propose a new building, they have to make a very, very clear argument for why that building needs to exist. That the first step is always um, to use what exists already. And so in a sense, education is changing to be more about care for the built environment than design of a new built environment. And I think, again, that's a transformational shift that's happening. You wanted to come in on that yeah, point, I'm, I think you have a very, very courageous statement to, uh, to say that because we tend maybe too much to say it's so easy, for example, to deal with climate change. We just need to do that. No, it's not easy. But it is a decision that the whole society has to take. And I think that it's very courageous to say we have to make some efforts because people do not want to, get, to, to hear this. Mm -hmm. So I really congratulate you for your, uh, this statement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we didn't speak about degrowth and donut economics, <laughs> um, um, but you touched on it and that, uh, that actually with that comes a realisation that we, we, we really cannot continue to have everything we want to have all the time. And that with, the sooner we face up to that reality, actually the better. But that doesn't necessarily mean a reduction in, in the quality of life. It means maybe a rethinking about, and that we spoke about rethinking about the term of, of beauty earlier. Um, there are two more questions there. What are the tools that are missing to switch fully to regenerative design? Jeffy, would you? Yeah, sure, I can take that. Um, one of the things, well, there's a few things I could say about this. One of the things uh, when we're designing as designers, 
uh, there is a limited tool set of really assessing the carbon impact of buildings. Yeah. They are now uh, coming more and more to fruition, but they're kind of set more towards a lot of specialists. Mm. And I think it's quite possible that in the future, as we're designing, as we're shaping buildings in the design process, we're always going to be having that feedback loop of how much does our building cost? And I don't mean just financially, I also mean sustainably. And uh, that's quite an exciting development that we're seeing, but still we need to, to make that shift of uh, usability. And then the second thing I'm, uh, I'm also hoping for is one day we're going to be seeing uh, carbon tax incentives. So, you know, we should be offsetting the cost of the construction of a sustainable building with the cost of an unsustainable building. This should be almost funding the new generation of buildings. It's not a very uh, easy thing to put forward uh, policy-wise, of course. There's uh, mm -hmm. massive hurdles and challenges to put that through. But we should be thinking about the concept of blended finance. We should be thinking about what are our objectives as a society and how can we actually finance that and push that forward. So, for example, financial risk might be linked to um, uh, buildings that are less at risk of damaging the environment, and that would be linked fin into financial investment systems, for example. This is something I know nothing about, but I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, I, I was at a, a finance um, uh, impact hub in Vienna last week, and they were very much uh, thinking about how can we subsidize new technologies to make them competitive okay. with existing technologies which aren't sustainable. And of course, you've seen that big uh, movements in you know, the wind, uh, wind energy production, solar production, and so forth. But in the construction industry, that is, that is I think, lacking at the moment. And uh, we can actually encourage these industries mm. to grow with regenerative uh, material usages. But we, of course, need to scale them up. Things aren't competitive at the low scales that they are today. Um, and there is a big industry of designers who, who want to use these tools, but are incapable because, well, there's a lack of funding coming from behind. Absolutely. I, and I think Martin's point about ram dirt connects nicely with that, that if you could see that, um, I suppose, foregrounding of um, material technologies that are, are less in use now that we would benefit from um, knowing about and using and innovating more broadly, and that might take some initial kind of uh, extra support, financial support, to, to get that happening on the ground. Just because we have a few minutes left, I'm going to go back to artificial intelligence. Could you mm. just say more about what you, what, how you see artificial intelligence linking to regenerative design and this paradigm shift? Yeah, sure. So uh, actually, when I read the book by uh, Professor Yuval Noah Harari uh, about the future, uh, uh, future of humankind, uh, he was writing about that what would our society look like if it was run and designed and managed by highly intelligent artificial intelligence uh, and algorithms that know ourselves and our next moves and our next clicks better than we do. So we do have that sort of uh, thing already there in the internet. We have uh, algorithms that predict what we are going to click next and what we are going to purchase perhaps and what sort of ads we should be given. Now take uh, 10 generations of uh, you know, evolution on top of that, which in the IT world goes very rapidly, obviously. So if we let it, uh, artificial intelligence to gather all possible data that it can from our planet, and then analyze that how would it be possible to optimize this in the most sustainable manner. I wonder what was given, what sort of role we would have then as humans. Of course, this is not going to happen. It's just, a, uh, just an idea. But seriously speaking, I think that there are lots of possibilities in, um, in the processing of, of big data gathered from the environment, gathered from the industry, gathered from the consumption patterns and, and everyday, uh, you know, activities of humans that could be mashed up and used for creating patterns of, of uh, life and business that would be more beneficial for the future of the planet. And I don't see that artificial intelligence and biocentrism would be the opposite ends of, the, of, the, of a line. But I think that I, artificial intelligence could be actually very much also nature-based intelligence. So we have just learned to discover all the 
models of nature that you have there in the fungi and in, in the communication systems in the forests and in the root systems of trees. Uh, can we tap into that somehow? Can we learn from that? Can we process that? I, I think we can't, but AI could. Yes. Should we invite AI into the new European Bauhaus? <laughs> Well, it's funny you should mention that um, because we were having a, a conversation a, a couple of weeks ago in the new European Bauhaus about the fact that it's, it is a distributed network, which is quite interesting. It like it's so not a hierarchical network, but one that is distributed. And that means that it can be more robust and more agile and uh, more resilient, potentially. And uh, I suppose that's just interesting in terms of what you're saying about the uh, the link between, uh, like the internet is a distributed network, essentially, it it, uh, it it works simultaneously on all levels at all times. Um, and so I see what you mean about that connection between the potential for artificial intelligence and um, the and, and nature. And we, we still know, there's so much we don't know. And I think realizing that we are not master of all of we, all that we survey, we are a tiny part of this beautiful planet and it's a planet we have to take care of. Um, and I, I think that there are complex questions that, that we've touched on today. This is the beginning of a conversation maybe about regenerative design in the context of the new European Bauhaus. And one that I'd certainly love to um, continue on at, at a future date. We're, Kind of drawing to a conclusion in the, the last five minutes, um, I just really want to uh, just use the last few minutes just to, to thank all of the panellists. I'm going to go to uh, Martin and Commissioner Simpson particularly to thank you for staying on, on Zoom. I know it's, it's challenging to be in a live session and be on Zoom simultaneously. And thank you for joining us remotely today and being part of the session. Um, it was really great to hear about your contributions and the work that you're doing, Martin, on uh, rammed earth construction and to hear what's happening then at the uh, European Commission scale in relation to uh, policy formation and the connection between policy and uh, what, what we need to transform on the ground. Um, the two or three panellists here in the space, thank you so much, Jeffrey Eberla. Mati Kutinen and Alessio Romaldi, it was an absolute pleasure. Um, and I, I quite like the fact that, that we weren't all necessarily all on the same page at all the time because it proves how complex uh, the question of regenerative design and the challenge that we face really is. Um, and thank you very much to our audience here, to everybody who contributed on Slido. Um, we only got a small amount of time to glimpse the snapshots, but hopefully maybe they can be maybe just flashed up on the screen for the last few minutes so that people can see them again. Um, because I think the, the inclusion in the conversation is really important. Uh, and as we said, this is a conversation that is going to um, go far beyond this session today. Um, this is day two of the festival and the beginning session, so there's going to be lots more activity in the forum, the fair and the fest for the rest of the day. But um, from me, that's, I just want to say thank you very much. And I have obviously have a round of applause to all of our panellists for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Rightfully so. And a round of applause for Orla, fantastic moderator as well, please. Thank you for a very nuanced discussion, as you said. Uh, there was a lot of uh, elements brought together. Um, do stay put because we're not finished yet. We're only getting started. Uh, there's a next segment uh, being prepared for you just now. People online, um, we will let go of you for just a couple of minutes. Do come back by 10.45, please. Then we're all set up again for the next big panel discussion. Um, so see you in a while.